Hello and welcome to Plants to Plants, episode five. Plants to Plants is a new series from Sci-Fi Systems. Uh, Sci-Fi Systems brings extraction and processing technology into the future. Uh, and Plants to Plants brings top tier experts to the table to inform viewers about what it takes to go from concept to completion on a hemp processing plant. Today's session is the expert vacuum panel, the first of our panel sessions. Uh, we have Gene Ligman from Labeled USA, Jason Steele of uh, Bush LLC, and Richard Mathe, AKA Dr. Tor of Casogen Vacuum. Without vacuum, as we know, solvent recovery and other processes would be impossible to execute. For operators, planners, business owners, and enthusiasts, a strong understanding of vacuum theory and application is critical for confidently developing, scaling, or operating a hemp extraction plant. Today, we will gain understanding by exploring multiple subjects, including vacuum fundamentals, how hardware choices impact vacuum efficiency, and vacuum control, and a whole lot else. Uh, now happy to introduce our panelists uh, with short descriptions. Gene Ligman of Labeled USA. Gene is an engineer specializing in process engineering, vacuum engineering, and vapor physics. Uh, started in the 1980s working in the nuclear field and is now centered on freeze drying and oil distillation processes. Having worked for Edwards Vacuum and Labeled, he has a broad understanding of vacuum equipment and vacuum applications. His focus on vapor physics gives him insight into applications like freeze drying and distillation, which is based on the fundamentals of vapor physics. Nuclear power is all about doing the same thing every day with no accidents, whereas freeze drying, oil distillation, and other production vacuum applications are about doing things different every day to make more profit than yesterday, which he finds much more interesting. When he's not working to help people make more money, he is helping, uh, he, he's uh, working to help his Kentucky garden make more tomatoes. Excellent, thank you so much for being here, Gene. Uh, we also have Richard Matthew of Casagen Vacuum. Uh, Richard Matthew Brand has began his career with Kinney Vacuum in 1972. Over the last 48 years, he has specialized in the sizing, application, and sales of vacuum pumps and systems. Products include single and two-stage rotary vein pumps, single and two-stage rotary piston pumps, single and two-stage liquid ring pumps, dry running vacuum pumps, and vacuum boosters combined with any of the aforementioned pumps. Before retiring from the Kinney Division of tooth field Vacuum and Blower Systems as Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Dr. Tora held management positions in vacuum application and sales at Varian, Bush, and Darley Custom Technology. He currently supports his daughter, Caitlin Matthew, CEO of Casagen Vacuum with advanced technical vacuum application consulting, problem solving and support, and some very good YouTube videos. I encourage everyone to go and check out after this as well. Uh, last but not least is Jason Steele. I believe I'm saying that correctly, I apologize if not, of Bush LLC. Uh, Dr. Jason Steele, chemical and pharmaceutical sales manager for Bush LLC. Jason's been working with Bush for four months, previously working for Edwards Vacuum and the University of Akron. He holds a doctorate in inorganic chemistry from the University of Akron. Uh, once again, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. And during this session, I want to let the audience know that you are, are absolutely welcome to ask questions. You can do that in the chat or you can use the Q&A module on your screen. We will integrate them into the conversation. Today's panel will be moderated by Sci-Fi Systems CEO Emmett McGregor. So without further ado, I am going to be bringing in our panelists and ending this introduction. Thank you very much and I will pass things off to Emmett. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, Edwin, and uh, welcome to all of our panelists. Uh, really exciting to have you all on. A, really a wealth of uh, experience in the vacuum fields and a variety of vacuum applications. Um, obviously, here on the show, we're focused on industrial hemp, but at Sci-Fi Systems, we've always taken the stance that learning from other industries is absolutely the uh, best way to uh, to go, not reinventing the wheel. In vacuum in particular, there's some extremely advanced and nuanced applications out there from nuclear, semiconductor, um, uh, vacuum coating, et cetera, um, that I know that we'll be drawing on today. And I, I think we'll take a, a journey from vacuum fundamentals, um, uh, some hardware discussion, and on into specific applications and some general questions and answers. Um, but just to start things off, I'd like to ask each of you to uh, think of a, uh, you know, an example of an in-the-field application that really excited you, uh, applying vacuum to something new or exciting, um, and just give us a, you know, a, a short introduction to yourself and a, a brief snippet of something that really interested you uh, in the vacuum field. Um, we'll start with uh, Jason from uh, Bush Vacuum. Uh, why don't you start off? All right, uh, so you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. All right, great. So uh, yeah, I'm Jason Steele. I've been with Bush right seven months now. I guess it, my profile didn't get updated yet, but uh, a lot of my uh, time has been with vacuum and drying vacuum uh, expertise coming from Edwards. 
uh, in my research and my doctorate's all been in anaerobic techniques where I manipulate uh, different compounds in a vacuum environment and air-free environment. So I have a lot of uh, training in it for over about 15 years now. So it's been exciting times. A lot of my focus has been on uh, inorganic polymers uh, and uh, using uh, anaerobic techniques to manipulate those. So uh, that's kind of my background right now. I'm the chemical and pharmaceutical sales manager uh, for Bush. I take a lot of pride in focusing down on the, the different mm -hmm. ways we can attack new problems. Uh, right. And it's and been a lot of fun. Just a, a, you know, an interesting project we worked on was um, it is with uh, silicon compounds. Uh, this was actually for adhesives. I can't say the name of the company, but uh, they use a water scavenging compound that I was very familiar with and it caused a lot of havoc on uh, liquid ring pumps that they were using. And so uh, what would happen is it would get into the oil and then it'd start reacting and form a uh, spray foam essentially in the oil and then no pump is gonna work if it can't rotate. And after we were able to uh, come up with a good plan, we changed some of the operations, we removed some uh, unnecessary filters and then we switched it from a uh, an oil steel pump to a dry pump, which will force these different contaminants through the pump instead of having a collection and a, uh, increasing the concentration of these compounds inside the pump. We were able to push them through and they have been running uh, with no problems for over a year now and they were going through a pump every week. So it's been, it was a fun project because I got to use some of my education background on it. But uh, other than that, it was a really great to help the customer out. And save great. Money. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, snapshot, Jason. And I know that uh, some of those listening will probably relate to this uh, idea of going through a pump every week. Uh, and some of the uh, experimental uh, or, or first process development phases and even in operation uh, on the hemp side, I know, uh, many businesses will go through a lot of pumps uh, before finally finding the right fit or finding a, a vendor partner that can work with them to eliminate uh, that risk of downtime from, from vacuum pump damage. Um, so, you know, thanks for that snapshot. And we'll dig in uh, more into this idea of dry pumps versus wet pumps a, a bit later in the, uh, in the panel, I'm sure. So we'll come back to that. Um, Gene, how about you? You uh, give us an example of an exciting project you've worked with with, uh, with Libel? Or... So I have found that the vacuum, vacuum technology and in industry is so widespread. Basically, almost anything high tech or almost even anything that's low tech that you touch or use on a daily basis probably is touched in some part of its manufacturing process by vacuum. Um, I've seen some really cool things. Like I stood in the building with the National Ignition Facility. This is a, a stainless steel sphere that's about 100 feet in diameter, peppered with uh, Thai sapphire windows that I think it had 528 lasers pointing uh, into this laser through these Thai sapphire windows down onto a little um, marble size uh, pellet that was filled with tritium. And it was to ignite hot fusion. You know, that was a cool project. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. I've been, I've actually have a picture of myself sitting in the, um, in the manned capsule for Blue Origin, you know, their, their manned space capsule. I have a picture that that factory tour was fascinating to see those rocket engines. But I have to say that a really interesting topic that I've come across recently that I, it was completely unexpected to me is freeze drying. Freeze drying is a lot more technical than people think. Um, because there's so many things that happen in the process that need to happen correctly. And of course, the challenge is to make the freeze dryer work properly, which is um, probably not actually so different from the oil distillation system, because there's a lot of condensation and vaporization going on. It's vapor physics, and I've actually found that it's super fascinating stuff. Um, and the more I dig into it, the more I like it. Great. Well, thank you, Gene. And I actually, I know that uh, freeze drying has been and is applied um, in the hemp and cannabis space for some of the value added ingredients out there. Um, maybe we can touch on that, see if you've had any experience, or maybe you could just hypothesize about uh, some of those freeze drying applications that uh, we might see in the future. Um, so look forward to touching on that again. Uh, Richard, um, how about yourself? What's an example of an exciting project? Well, as you can imagine, 
the applications and markets have changed unbelievably since I started. When I started, it was uh, vacuum tubes, TV tubes on big carousels with small pumps, maybe a hundred at a time going around and evacuating. Well, of course, that's completely gone now. Then we went to the semiconductor industry, which has been a huge boom for the vacuum business. But from my experience, all these years living in various parts of the country, things are different. I've been to the Nevada test site where I had to be weighed going in and out, which was kind of unusual uh, for security reasons. But actually, I think the most uh, interesting market that I got into was the vacuum packaging of fresh meat. People don't realize that each pack of fresh meat is evacuated down to about two tour and speed is everything. And the reason they go to two tour is they want to remove the residual oxygen. If people see brown meat, they're probably not going to buy it, even though it doesn't matter. It's just that the oxygen has changed its color. So they need red meat in there. So if you could go into a meat plant on one machine and increase the speed by, say, two per minute, that's 120 per hour. And if you have 10 machines, and the last shift goes home at the end of the day when the last meat is packed, you can see how much money is saved by going to a more efficient vacuum system and why it's such a huge market. Uh, some of the plants I went into, 7,500 head of hog a day, which is uh, pretty amazing. Wow, yeah. You never quite think about that space being uh, one where vacuum is applied, but yeah, a lot of packaging and, and also yeah. cross applicability into really a, a ton of products out there that need to be kept oxygen free, could be vacuum packed. Um, we, we are even in some limited cases seeing vacuum packing uh, on wholesale uh, products, um, you know, as far as botanicals across hemp, but hemp cannabis and, uh, and other botanical markets where mm -hmm. oxygen can really degrade the product over time. So mm -hmm. uh, love to dig into that uh, more in the future as well. Thank you for the introduction, Richard. So, First off, I'd like to, um, as we get into to some more uh, Q&A here, I'd like to dig into some fundamentals of a vacuum and the way that uh, we start looking at vacuum uh, from the, the very ground up. I think most people think of vacuum, their first experience with vacuum is a vacuum cleaner, right, where you're using vacuum to essentially provide suction power. Um, and our, these vacuum ac applications were essentially uh, we are handling vacuum chambers and we're reducing pressure in order to manipulate the, generally to manipulate the vapor pressure of a, uh, of a given compound. Uh, we are really getting into ranges where the materials themselves start to behave entirely differently. Uh, and I'll give a, an interesting example from the, from the broader world recently that I saw where an, under a uh, lower pressure environment, uh, they simulated the surface of Mars and saw that uh, under those low vacuum, uh, those low pressure conditions, uh, like on the surface of Mars, that, that mud uh, actually moves completely differently. They, what they uh, described it as is boiling toothpaste is what um, mud and uh, uh, liquid slurries move like on Mars. But this implies some interesting things uh, for our market as well, that materials handling uh, becomes entirely different within a vacuum environment. And also that by manipulating pressure into the low pressure uh, or uh, vacuum range, uh, we have some really extreme degrees of control uh, over the different materials that, that we are uh, dealing with. Um, so I imagine we're gonna see some extremely innovative uh, applications moving forward that ha people haven't even thought of yet. Uh, but to start with, there's sort of two main vacuum areas in the hemp industry that most uh, companies are going to be handling. And that is in solvent recovery, uh, where you're reducing the, uh, the uh, boiling point of a target solvent to separate it away from a concentrate, uh, you know, an extract uh, oil in this case. Um, and then in deep vacuum uh, distillation, where cannabinoids themselves are being uh, purified 
uh, out from an oil by achieving a distillation of a, of a relatively high boiling point at atmosphere uh, compound. So when we think about a vacuum uh, system, um, I'm gonna start here perhaps with, uh, with Gene. Uh, Gene, when you think about uh, a, a brand new application, if we just threw all the existing knowledge and know-how out the door and we uh, looked at uh, you know, how to analyze a given process from the ground up that may have been done at atmosphere. Solvent recovery was done at atmosphere for years and years, you know, hundreds or thousands of years before vacuum was ever uh, really sufficiently being uh, possible to create. Um, you know, what are the, the key factors that we look at uh, for a new application to decide how deep of a vacuum uh, we need to apply to a given process? Um, some people have argued that maybe in evaporating ethanol, for example, um, that vacuum might not even be necessary. Uh, how do you start from the ground up in looking at, you know, why apply vacuum? Yeah, the key thing in any kind of system where you have boiling and, con and condensation, and in this case, solvent recovery is boiling the alcohol off of out of one area and condensing it in another. It's a, it's a form of mass transfer of alcohol from one location to the other. The reason that you would do it under vacuum as opposed to at atmospheric pressure is as you go lower in pressure, the temperature that you boil at also goes lower. So if you want to process your material at a lower temperature, then you have to process it also at a lower pressure. That's really the essential reason why you would draw vacuum in any process. Um, that is to say any um, vaporization type process. Primarily it's because you wanna control the temperature and pressure at which you're processing. Often, as in the case of say cannabis, you want to maintain a temperature that's a little bit lower than what you would get at atmospheric pressure because it helps prevent or slow down rather the thermal degradation of the product that you're trying to achieve or that you're trying to produce. Um, a great example of this is potato chips, right? Um, potato chips that you get out of the bag are always this nice uniform sort of yellow color. Um, the reason that they are never burned and singed anymore, because those of us who've been around for a while know that you used to open up a bag of potato chips and some of them were kind of brownish on the edges and they tasted a little, a little different. The reason they're not like that anymore is because all of the boiling of those potato chips are now done under vacuum. You cannot exceed 170 degrees or whatever the target temperature is that gives you that nice golden brown color because the pressure won't allow you to go higher in temperature than that. So wow. uh, the other thing that's really um, something to keep in mind when you're when you're applying vacuum to a system where you have boiling and condensation happening is the most important factor is when you're, when you're pumping condensables, the most, the easiest way to remove condensables from your system is to condense them, right? So you can pump them with a pump. A is to condense them first and then pump out whatever the condenser can't handle. Now there's always some things that the condenser can't condense properly, that's what you use the vacuum for. Right, so that's a, that's a key thing that I think is maybe a, a mindset change for some people when they're just starting to look at these processing systems is that the vacuum pump isn't really there to handle the vapor that you're producing, or it, uh, yeah, I'll say the, the solvent vapor in particular in a solvent recovery application, for example. It's there to get your pressure down and then your, your condensing system, which typically can, uh, is a condenser plus a cold trap, which is a, a lower temperature condenser that's there for, for pump protection. Um, those, those are really doing the heavy lifting of keeping your vacuum level down once it's there. The Correct. vacuum pump really removes the atmosphere from the system and then is there to fight any leaks in the system uh, of non-condensable gases, things like nitrogen uh, or um, you know, other miscellaneous gases that are out there in the atmosphere that, uh, that are not going to condense in your condenser. So that's a, a key and interesting point uh, to, to address there. Um, it also brings up uh, another sort of uh, interesting vacuum fundamentals uh, question. And that is uh, when we, we sometimes look at uh, pump curves and the performance of a vacuum pump uh, at given uh, pressures 
uh, in terms of you know, CFM, as well as uh, in the graph with the vacuum depth that you're looking at. Um, can you explain uh, to us, uh, let's say maybe Jason, uh, why is it that we see different performance uh, or, or apparently you know, perhaps declining performance of the pump from a CFM perspective uh, as we're going down into deeper and deeper vacuum? Uh, could you just give us a baseline uh, yeah. understanding? Yeah. I'd yeah, I wanted to touch on just briefly on what we were just talking about too, just for a sure. reference. So sure. the, the importance of the condenser also it decreases the amount of capacity that you need on a vacuum pump. So if you say we're boiling off one milliliter of water and we're at 0.1 torr, which is a common pressure when we're doing distillation, the amount of volume from that one milliliter has gone up to 10,000 liters. So if we're not condensing that out, we have to uh, take that on the back end of the vacuum pump. So that's just, just so you, for the, the viewers, I guess, the big difference uh, of vapor versus the liquid itself. So, uh, so I just, that's my little caveat I want to add on to that. Just um, the importance I'd of like to having a good condenser. And maybe we can explore that a little bit more after this uh, yeah, section, because uh, I think there's some big points there. Yeah, and so the reason why vacuum pumps start to trail off as you go further and further down is it depends on the mechanism and how they work and how it removes the air particles and how it, 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 get rid, it gets rid of them. And you can only move a certain amount of air at different points in the, in the, in the, in the curve. So there's different types. You have just uh, laminar flow, and then you have just turbulent flow where the molecules are going around wherever they are. And you're taking advantage of these and you're removing those by small expansions inside the pump. And as you get down to a range, the likelihood of those gas molecules and making it into the pump becomes less and less. So the efficiency and the air density, it becomes less and less as you're getting down to a lower pressure. And then you ultimately reach an impasse and it depends on the type of mechanism that you're using to seal off your vacuum pumps or inside the vacuum pump. Great. Well, that's, that's a great, you know, primer there. The, the key thing that I take away from that is that at a certain vacuum depth, and it's going to be different for different uh, compounds, for different uh, vapors, um, but at a certain point, you reach a tipping point where the gas is no longer really acting almost more like a fluid, and it starts to act like a, a group of particles. And those particles actually have to make it into the pump for the pump to be able to remove that, that gas. Right. So the different mechanisms uh, have handle the gas in those different densities of particles, shall we say, uh, better than others. So you right. see some specialty pumps, things like uh, turbo molecular pumps being a, an easy uh, one that comes to mind where it performs very well at very, very low vacuum because it's essentially designed to just particle by particle pull out any remaining gas. Now, this leads me to a follow-up question that I think uh, Richard might be able to chime in on, uh, which is when we're designing a vacuum system, uh, you have the pump itself, uh, but then you have how the pump is connected to the vacuum chamber. And uh, when we look at that, we at Sci-Fi Systems have taken a, a pretty conservative design approach uh, to this, trying to minimize the distance from the vacuum pump uh, to the point of use, trying to use larger diameter vapor ports, uh, vapor piping in between the system and the vacuum uh, pump itself. Uh, could you maybe just enlighten us a, a little bit as to that uh, gas handling systems, vapor handling systems, and, and some key points of design that we should maybe be aware of when we're uh, mating a pump to a vacuum chamber? Yes. Uh, you can have the uh, appropriate pump, but if it's not installed properly, it's not going to be as efficient as uh, you would like, and it may damage the pump, <clears throat> or it may damage the product. So one of the things to keep in mind, as I think we discussed earlier, is to protect the pump. No vacuum pump uh, is designed to handle liquid slugs or particulate. While there are some pumps that are more forgiving, particularly the liquid ring pump. But when you get into the other type of pumps, Vein pumps, for instance, cannot tolerate any slugs or anything like that. So you have to take precaution that there is no liquid coming into the pump. You also want to keep out as much particulate as possible. So 
you might want to just put on an inlet trap, bag type filter, whatever. Now you also want to have an isolation valve so you can isolate the vacuum pump from your system. You're going to need that just in case you're not getting the performance you think you deserve. And I think the easiest way to do it is isolate the pump and then you find out if the pump is the problem or not. So you don't waste a lot of time and then you can go on with the leak detection. So an isolation valve is important. You also need an air admissions valve on the inlet where you want to admit pump air into the inlet of the pump after you've isolated it from the system and you're going to shut the pump down. You don't want to shut the pump down in the vacuum. And you also have to have appropriate locations for the gauge, whatever gauges you're going to be using. You might want to have two connections or maybe even more, but you certainly have to have one. And then as far as the discharge goes, you have to make sure that you never, under any circumstances, restrict the flow of the discharge. Uh, you know, it can tolerate maybe three PSIG, but anything above that is going to have a uh, bad effect on the pumping, uh, the horsepower, and even worse if it's too much back pressure. So, and one of the other things the, we, about the diameter, you don't want to restrict the pump. The conductance is determined by the smallest port in the whole manifold. So to have three inch, four inch line with a half inch orifice someplace in it, that half inch is going to determine the, the pumping speed. So the three to four inches don't mean anything for you at that point, okay? You want to use an elbow in there that you have to, you should have a sweep elbow because if you have a, a 90 degree elbow, it's going to make it more difficult for the molecules to come out. The lower in pressure that you get, you get down into the molecular flow range and the mean free path of the molecules expands and expands and expands. And that's why they kind of meander out at low pressure. As a result, you can see on the speed curve. Great, and I think you, you brought up some, ooh, getting a little echo there. Um, you, you brought up some really key terminology there. Um, you know, conductance uh, and the mean mm -hmm. free path. Um, also, we sometimes talk about impedance, which is a, you know, a related uh, principle. Maybe I can uh, throw this over to one of the other panelists to explore. Um, is there one of those uh, sort of uh, in the installation of your vacuum systems that you give uh, most consideration to that you might want to highlight, uh, Gene? Uh, impedance, conductance, mean free path? A great example for this is um, the typical um, cannabis distillation system that we've seen designed historically anyway. Um, it was essentially a, a diffusion pump as your high vacuum pump for the distillation process and a small roughing pump. This system was actually designed as a pilot test system for other molecular distillation. It wasn't really ever designed for production. So why this matters is, well, at least at first, the systems are evolving now, but at least at first you had to run your your bulk oil through your cannabis distillation system twice, right? First to do your terpene cut and then to do your cannabinoid cut. Well, when you have this little small roughing pump that's pulling vacuum through your diffusion pump, which is full of all these really small clearances, you have lost almost all of your pumping speed that goes to that roughing pump. Not a problem when you're on your cannabinoid cut because your diffusion pump is actually running and it's pumping. But when you don't have it running, which is during your terpene cut, because as you mentioned, certain pumps have certain limiting limit of operation. You can't run a diffusion pump really above 50 microns. So, and your, your terpene cut is usually at one or 200 microns. So the diffusion pump has to be offline. If you're trying to pull your vacuum through the diffusion pump, guess what? You're going to lose pretty much most of your vacuum pumping. So proper design of your system for production, which wasn't really what was considered first when these systems means that you should, you should do something like have a larger diffusion or a larger roughing pump 
and a specific backing line that goes straight to your system, not through the diffusion pump. And the second thing is you should have a valve on the inlet of that diffusion pump so that you can shut it, close the valve and keep the diffusion pump hot, right? If you turn off the diffusion pump when you don't want it to be pumping, it takes you a fair amount of time to heat that back up. Now, when you're in the lab and you're using this tool as a you know, R&D a piece of equipment, that lost 20 minutes or half hour, no big deal. But when you, when you consider that if you're putting a kilogram of oil through your small uh, tabletop distillation system and your kilogram of oil is worth, what, three to $7,000 and you lose a half an hour, you just lost $3,500 of production because you had to wait for your diffusion pump to heat up because you didn't have a valve. Um, this, the other thing is if you can't run enough vapor, if you can't pull in a vacuum because you're pumping through your diffusion pump, when you're doing your terpene cut, you have to keep your feed rate very, very low. So it takes you twice as long, three times as long, four times as long to get the same amount of oil through your machine uh, as if you had put a dedicated line from your roughing pump. So mm -hmm. system design in a an application like that can make the difference from making a little bit of money to making a huge amount of money on the same system. It's just a matter of designing it properly. Right, and the key thing there, when you, when you talk about pulling through the diffusion pump, the thing uh, there is, is that because the path through the diffusion pump is not a straight shot, your, uh, the diameter of your, uh, of your pathway going through the diffusion pump to the roughing pump um, is not as large as if you had a dedicated line going from one pump to the next. You're essentially adding barriers uh, between where the evaporation is happening and where the source of vacuum is. And because of that, you're going to see uh, a decrease in vacuum performance. Every time you add a bend or a constriction, you're going to add to the pressure drop of the system between the vacuum source and the source of vapor. And every time you add to the pressure drop, you're going to see decrease in vacuum performance, essentially, uh, right? And so right. what, what uh, Gene was mentioning there is something that um, from, as he mentioned, these essentially pilot research uh, pot still distillation systems that, that the industry started in research and application on to more contemporary approaches with white film distillation type stills that are used for cannabinoid distillation, um, an evolution has had to happen uh, in vacuum design where uh, keeping the mean free path of the vapor from the point of generation to the point of either condensation uh, or the point where the vacuum pump removes that particle from the system as short as possible. So essentially the mean free path is uh, if you imagined the pathway that a single particle has to bounce its way from its point of origin to its point of exit or its point of condensation, it is that amount of linear, uh, of linear travel between point of origination to its terminus point. Uh, and the longer that is, the worse your vacuum performance is going to be. Does that sound approximately right, Jason? Yeah, and with the when we're down in these pressure ranges, we're with molecular flow, as you're saying, they just go randomly. They don't necessarily go, even if they're hitting here, they can bounce back the same, uh, the same way they just came in. So we want to increase the likelihood of them making it to a diffusion pump or a turbo pump, something like that. So you don't want to restrict your flow to that. You want to have that as close as possible to where you're trying to evacuate that from. So any bend, any turn, any even traps will cut the conduct or cut the pumping capacity of a diffusion pump or a, a turbo pump almost in half, even more, depending on how far away it is. Great, thank you. And I, here's something that I saw recently that kind of blew me away. Um, I wasn't expecting it, uh, and the people doing this assure me that that it works, but I'm pretty skeptical. I saw a white film evaporator being operated. Uh, two separate white film evaporators being operated off of a manifolded uh, house vacuum system that was located in another room um, without a booster pump inside the room. Uh, so what that brought up for me is, you know, in these large plants that have multiple applications of vacuum, uh, 
Um, I know in other industries, it's fairly common to have a house vacuum system that provides a baseline vacuum supply for intermittent use, uh, or potentially in some cases even for, for continuous use. Um, I wondered, uh, uh, Richard, whether you might be able to give us some insight into, you know, what type of processes is it appropriate to apply a house vacuum uh, for? And, you know, uh, is that, uh, that type of system something we might see more in this industry space? Well, I don't think <clears throat> that you'll see that in this industry. Uh, my experience from central vacuum systems is pretty rough vacuum. We're talking in the range of, uh, at the best, uh, 25 tour or something like that, because there are so many variables. Depends. You might have four or five stations that you're using one big pump or something. I can't imagine being down in the micron range and doing that. Uh, the ones I've seen have been uh, for holding down printed circuit boards, what they call vacuum chucking, transfer. Hospitals sometimes use a central system. All hospitals have vacuum pumps. And sometimes they have duplex systems, which could be central. You see the hospital room, they see the sign that's the hole in the wall that says vacuum. But that is a, a very rough vacuum. I don't have any experience of somebody like down to five times 10 to the minus three tour uh, with a central system. And you said without a booster as well? So they, uh, they did have a. Um they did have a, a roots blower in place, yeah. but it was at outside the room at the point of vacuum generation. Uh, so that it was, you know, I think that it's an, a suboptimal vacuum design. I just sort of yeah. wanted to unearth why that might be. I see that Gene has his hand raised. Um, uh, did you yeah. have some, that's something to chime in on? I could make a distinction on the house vacuum versus what I call process vacuum. It's almost never a good idea to try to use house vacuum on a individual production type process. And there are a number of reasons. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest, most important reasons is if, you, if your process or if your house vacuum system fails, if you have a single vacuum pump that's pump providing vacuum to all of your systems and it fails, your entire production is down. Whereas if you have a vacuum pump that's dedicated to each one of your process tools, whether it's a distillation system, a solvent recovery system, or a potato chip boiling system, or food packaging, only that system is down while the rest of your operation is running. Um, but there's more and more reasons. Um, as Richard mentioned, it's very difficult to achieve the vacuum you want, but um, also if you have two systems or three systems that are running at the same time on a vacuum system, when you open a roughing valve, say to draw vacuum on one system, it's going to change the pressure in all of your systems and that could cause extreme disruptions. For example, if you were backing diffusion pumps on a house vacuum system, which would be ridiculous, um, you would probably trip those diffusion pumps offline if you have the proper trips or you would blow the oil backwards into the chamber when you open your roughing valve on another system. So it's super complex. It doesn't really save you any money. It puts all of your process at risk. Um, it puts everything on a single bottleneck, which is a very risky thing to do. And it gives you no redundancy. So the, it's, it's not a good idea to try to use a house vacuum for a process type vacuum application. Great, thanks for that, uh, that insight. And um, you know, I, I could see how the temptation would be there to uh, use a single vacuum for multiple applications because, of course, you have economy of scale. Uh, you can buy bigger and bigger pumps, and apparently that gives you a better value per CFM uh, you know, at a given vacuum depth, right? Um, so I, I'm wondering if the temptation was there to do this, and perhaps it's as simple as you need, uh, you need redundancy. Maybe you have multiple pumps in a central line. Again, I'm not recommending that you do this, um, but it brings up something uh, that we have much thought about implementing into some of our systems, but up until now have, have uh, avoided it. But I think that there might be some particular use cases that we should consider, and that's using a vacuum accumulator 
uh, to provide additional elasticity in the vacuum system uh, for given applications. And this could be for a single process that has a single pump, uh, but where you're trying to uh, you know, avoid peaks and lows in vacuum. Um, it, it, I'll allow anybody to chime in here. Uh, maybe raise your hand if you want to respond. But do you think vacuum accumulators are, in general, something that should be considered? Uh, and when should they be considered? Um, you know, you don't even have to be specific to hemp. Let's just talk in general con conceptual terms here. Um, maybe I'll give Jason the first opportunity to, to discuss if he has anything to um, we've used them sometimes, but we more use them if you want to do rapid pump down uh, because it gives you a head start because you do have that pressure equalization. So you get a head start. You're at your area that's already at lower vacuum and it pulls it down quicker. But then you have to do the calculations to make sure that that even makes sense because it's only a brief period. And so if, if the chamber is the right size and you're your buffer tank is sometimes referred to as the right size and it makes sense, but it just adds to another chamber essentially that you have to evacuate. So it, it can be, it becomes cumbersome and sometimes it's useful, but with like, we use it a lot, it, not a lot. We use it sometimes in food packaging because that's where Bush is, we're renowned in that market, but we don't, it's not our go-to. It's only if we need to. Any, uh, any comments from uh, Richard or Gene on vacuum accumulators? And then I'll propose a potential application where it might make sense. Yes, uh, I've used them in the past uh, on some occasions. But as Jason said, uh, the trade-off is now you have to evacuate the storage tank, as I call it, or accumulated tank or whatever. It, you're adding volume to the system. Now, sometimes it's used to uh, protect the pump. If you're on some vacuum application, tabletop, uh, <clears throat> and you're cycling, and you don't want the pump exposed to atmosphere during that period, so you have this accumulated tank. So it is pumping down, and then when the valve opens, usually automatically, when it gets to a certain pressure, and the process is done, and then you move on. Uh, but I haven't seen it done in any, uh, application in the uh, higher vacuum range uh, it's always been in a 29 inches 25 tour 10 tour 5 tour somewhere in that range but uh, it's not very common uh, to be used in some cases it's okay yeah I guess um, one specific application case that we've looked at uh, in, and it comes from, you know, some very niche applications relative to the, the total market, but would be as an, as, as a, um, using a, a, an accumulator to quickly evacuate an extraction chamber um, after biomass is introduced at atmospheric pressure into a chamber that needs to be evacuated before introducing a flammable solvent. So that's one specific use case where we've seen it used, although infrequently out there, um, but that's because it's a, an intermittent uh, and uh, rapid application of vacuum where you, know, you might do this once uh, you know, for five minutes every hour um, and you just need to get that vacuum down as quickly as possible and then the vacuum pump can catch up um, because it has the rest of that hour to be pumping down that accumulator tank. Um, so yeah, this is a uh, this is typically um, this is typically how you use an accumulator. Absolutely, Emmett. It's for fast roughing from atmosphere to some level of vacuum. Usually, it's to half an atmosphere because you make the volume the same in your accumulator as you have in your chamber. But you can do different ratios. And then once that is done, of course, you shut the valve and then you spend the rest of the time evacuating that cylinder again or the the accumulator again. So you can use a very small pump to achieve very fast pump down, but it's only during rough, your, your, your initial roughing stage, just like Jason and Richard mentioned, yeah. Great. Uh, so I want to open up and encourage everybody, uh, any of our attendees to please ask questions. Use the Q&A panel, uh, use the, uh, the chat box here. Uh, if anybody has any questions for, for our panelists, we're, we're wide open and, uh, and welcome audience participation. Um, in the 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, I want to talk a little bit more specifically about the, the distillation systems and some conclusions that we've reached and maybe uh, have you all chime in on whether you think that this is, um, this is the best fit application. Uh, so for our white film distillation systems where we are going down into deep vacuum and uh, we have to distill cannabinoids relatively high boiler or uh, yeah, relatively high boiler, um, we have decided to go with dry pumps. Um, we've decided to go with specifically uh, dry screw vacuum pumps and combined with a roots blower package uh, for the short path distillation where uh, we need to get down into, into deeper vacuum. The reason that we've done that is because uh, we've seen time and time again, these wet pumps, things like rotary vein pumps that are using oil as part of the mechanism of creating the vacuum, uh, getting fouled um, by, uh, you know, by process uh, fluid uh, that comes over, you know, uh, some resin comes over, terpenes in particular is a, a frequent problem, uh, and can foul that pump and cause the oil to need to be replaced on a frequent basis or else risk damage to the pump. Uh, and then additionally, that we found that the roots blower can offer a pretty good reliability profile for this specific application and matches the vacuum depth that we're using. Um, one last piece of why we're, we're using uh, dry screw pumps rather than something like a rotary vein that offers some you know, competitive pricing per uh, unit of capacity, but that there is some risk of backstreaming uh, at least into the cold trap, uh, if not you know, further out into the process where vacuum oil, especially in the event of a failure uh, or a power failure or in, you know, some interruption in, in common operation that you might see some backstreaming of oil into your process, which then you have to, you know, face batching issues where maybe you have to throw out the oil that you're using because it's contaminated with vacuum oil that's not approved for uh, human consumption. Um, so I wanted to, to give everybody the, you know, opportunity. What do you think about that application? Are there other pumps that we or our audience could consider? Uh, any you know, cost benefit analysis of uh, root splowers, for example, versus say diffusion pumps and other things. Really want to sort of spitball on the application. I see Richard uh, wants to jump in here. Well, I think you've uh, selected a, a terrific system. First of all, I would choose the uh, screw pump over the other types of dry pumps. And uh, vacuum boosters are extremely useful. They uh, extend the vacuum level and increase the capacity and they're very economical. They're just basically a vacuum accelerator, a valveless compressor, and if you keep everything in the vapor state going through the booster, there will be no chemical attack. And the dry pumps are extremely reliable, particularly the screw. I believe they have a blank off of uh, maybe uh, 10 microns or maybe a little below, but then when you couple it with the booster, you can get down uh, considerably better vacuum. And uh, you, you could use a nitrogen purge on the uh, dry pump to keep it clean. Uh, there are many uh, advantages to what you're doing. And, uh, you know, using the booster dry pump as opposed to a larger dry pump makes complete sense. And, uh, you know, initial cost, operating cost, Everything. Great. Yeah. Better vacuum. I think that's a good selection. Thanks. Yeah. Any other any other comments from the? We always the... Uh, kind of make the the joke more uh, suck for your buck when you use a booster. It's just like putting a supercharger on your car. It uh, you get more performance out of what you base it. It crams more air into it. And the, the other advantages uh, that the screw pump has is you you can also ingest solvent into them. You can slow them down. Because uh, they can operate at different frequencies because they have oil in them only in the gearbox um, or some type of lubrication. And that's in the gearbox and you just are using that for uh, lubrication, not for sealing like on a rotary vein pump. You need that to seal the veins that are going against the sidewalls. Uh, so you can slow these down significantly. Then you can ingest a liquid, which will clear if you're having charring or anything coming through when you have your terpenes or your different oils that somehow make it to the pump. They might burn inside or oxidize or something, and then you could clear them out with a solvent flush, and then uh, you'd be ready to go after you do a nitrogen impersion, dry it out. Right, ease of maintenance. So yeah, if you do have gum up from some oil accidentally getting pulled into the pump, 
well, you can use an actual cleaning solution, an approved cleaning solution to, to clean it out and you're, you have a good chance of getting back to optimal performance after that rather, mm -hmm. rather than uh, some other types of pumps that may have some you know, catastrophic failure type scenarios. I do see a question from the field here um, uh, asking about turbo pumps for SPD um, applications, I guess, turbo molecular pumps for use in, uh, you know, white film distillation. Anybody have any comments on that? Uh, I think he may be fishing for some downsides. <laughs> we, turbo we have some experience with this. So there's a number of, a number of OEMs who are using turbo pumps on their short path distillation systems. There are trade-offs in every type of pump, right? So the turbo pump is clean. It has no oil to, to, um, to backstream. It is generally very durable, but it can be susceptible to accumulation of condensed um, oils and stuff on, a, on the rotor. Um, so a turbo pump, by the way, is basically a very high speed, multi-stage, really fancy fan, right? That um, if you like, although it's, there's a lot of nuance there, it basically swats the molecules downwards um, towards the, the exhaust from the inlet. If the ro these rotors run at, you know, 10 to 50,000 RPM, sometimes 60,000 RPM, very fast. If there's any imbalance on the rotor whatsoever, it will start to put wear on the bearings. Um, and if there's enough imbalance, it'll actually, the, the pump won't run at all because it'll sense that it's too imbalanced to run. So you, you have to, these, these pumps are usable, very usable, but you have to install them in the system correctly. Um, you have to put them in the right orientation and you have to protect them with valves. Just like with a diffusion pump, you want to protect a turbo pump with valves as well. Turbo pumps are susceptible to catastrophic failure if you vent the inlet of the turbo pump while it's running at full speed. This is something that is a challenge for short path distillation systems because some of the people operating the SPD systems, they're, they're not you know, vacuum technologists. They're people who are just trying to run a system. Um, they may or not uh, operate the system properly. So making a system operator proof, which is the goal of all of us in this panel, um, is a goal that you should really embrace. Turbo pumps have great advantages over the diffusion pump in that the throughput, that is to say the amount of the number of molecules that they can pump per unit time for, um, for its pressure range is higher than the diffusion pump. This is mostly because diffusion pump pumping drops off radically as soon as you get up above one millitor in pressure. And in these systems, you're not running at one millitor, you're running at 10 to 50 microns, right? A mic millitor, micron, same thing. So you're really running above the, the pressure at which the diffusion pump is really designed to operate. So you'll get better pumping with a diffusion, with a turbo pump over the diffusion pump. You just have to make sure that you set it up properly. Um, and if I could just go back to the, to the dry pumps, the, the, the dry pumps are, um, the screw pump is perhaps one of the best pumping mechanisms that's been invented for industrial um, vacuum pumping. It is super rugged. Um, it is a pump that will run and run and run. However, there are nuances, right? So because you're ingesting what I call stickies, these are, you know, um, organic substances into the uh, pump that will condense as it compresses through the compression cycle of that pump, you will get stickies that deposit on your pump rotors. So the temperature that you run those rotors at matters and it matters a lot. The durability of a pump um, will be greatly affected by how high the temperature gets inside that pump in the internals because you'll get polymerization or if you like pyrolysis, right? Where you're basically cracking that oil into other solids and you'll start to deposit things like tars and carbon solids and stuff on your rotors until you fill the clearances and the pump seizes. So choosing the vacuum pump is, is a key thing. Choose the right one and you'll have great success for a long time. It's the same with turbo pumps versus diffusion pumps. Great, thank you for that uh, in-depth uh, look at that. I see a uh, 
I see a question here. When using a cold trap, is the condensate recovered or is it disposed of? I'll go ahead and answer that. And that is up to the operator. Um, we typically design our cold traps uh, to be capable of discharging the collected material um, in you know, batches in as easy a way for the operator to handle as possible. Um, so that means that you could feasibly collect it and use it as a byproduct, a value add byproduct. In distillation, um, it really depends what the material is, uh, whether that material in your cold trap is going to be of, the, of any value or not. Um, we commonly see uh, from some other uh, manufacturers using cold traps that effectively have no easy way to get the material out of the cold trap other than thawing it out, opening up the trap, and essentially scraping it out or, uh, or turning it upside down, heating it up and letting it drip out or something like that, which just to us doesn't seem a very practical way to approach this issue. You know, from the end user um, operability standpoint, you want a way to be able to discharge the materials out uh, as you collect them. Now, obviously, uh, if you need to do a full batch clean, you need to open it up. We want you to be able to crack into that system uh, open it up and do a complete clean uh, and disassemble it from the system to make sure that it's operating effic effectively and you're not getting cross-contamination or anything like that. Um, but that's a quick answer to that cold trap question is, uh, it depends on your, how you're using it, but we like to at least give the opportunity for the cold trap to be readily discharged for a byproduct to be collected. Now, importantly, I wanna make a note here, if you're using a wet pump, if you're not using a gas, uh, a, uh, a dry pump, then you want to make sure that when you collect that byproduct, it is not contaminated with an oil stream because part of its purpose is to protect your system from the potential of any backstreaming of vacuum oil out of your vacuum pump if you're using a wet pump. So be careful. You don't want to introduce a contaminated byproduct into an end, you know, a human consumption product, for example, accidentally. Uh, because you're taking your cold trap condensate and putting it into a product without considering that potential. So that one big caveat there. Um, Could I add something to that, Emmett? Sure. So cold trap design matters. Um, also, I have seen so many short path distillation systems out there whose cold traps are not insulated. Now consider, you know, on the actual cold part of the element of the cold trap, you're condensing the material and it drops off and it goes down into your holdings um, area, where if it's not insulated, it will simply be reheated and revaporize. Now, some of that vapor will end up back on the condenser coil and just recondense. But uh, fluids under vacuum don't really just fly around um, completely randomly. They actually flow in sort of rivers, um, if you will, uh, especially when you're at higher pressures. So some of that material that's laying as liquid in the bottom of your cold trap is revaporizing and it's flowing up and bypassing your condenser that's inside your cold trap and going straight out into the probably the either diffusion pump or the uh, turbo pump inlet or in your case uh, Emmett the it's going down the line to the blower uh, which means it's going to end up in your vacuum system so if you have a short path distillation system whose um, cold trap is not insulated and from what I've seen in the field that's most of them um, put some insulation on it. It's a cheap way to uh, help your system run a little bit cleaner. And the, the temperature that you run in that cold trap matters. It matters a lot. So the temperature, again, and pressure are going to be uh, running along the vapor point. The colder you make it, the better vacuum you'll be able to, to pull in that system. Yep. And a quick, quick plug here. We are Sci-Fi Systems. We've uh, collaborated with uh, Scientific 710 on the design of a couple of uh, unique custom cold traps, the black hole and the white dwarf, which are insulated, which have uh, ease of discharge of the material out. Because another factor that might lead to some of these things revaporizing going into your pump is if you allow too much to pull in the cold trap, the more that's in there, the more likely it is to revaporize uh, and go into your vacuum um, because it's more difficult to keep it at a very low temperature. We do typically advise, consider using liquid nitrogen as your coolant, but know how to control it effectively. 
right? You have to make sure you're dosing it uh, into your cold trap fast enough to keep the liquid temp uh, the temperature of the cold trap down and not so fast that you're just wasting nitrogen uh, everywhere and just, you know, essentially letting money evaporate, right? Um, so uh, we work with people all the time uh, to, to help to deliver those cold traps to, for pump protection. Another thing to consider, you know, it seems overkill to some people, but if you can, consider a duplex cold trap, but use cold traps, uh, two cold traps in line that are designed to be low impedance so that you are not adding a bunch of drag into your system. You're actually having two cold traps that are allowing for the non-condensables to pass through the system effectively, but simultaneously are effectively trapping the condensables. And that takes a lot of detail of design to do that effectively, but that is something we have done uh, out there in the field previously. And it is a way to give yourself even more confidence in your pump protection. Um, let's see, I see a question. Is there a reason not to use a rotary phase converter uh, tw uh, 220 volt two pole to a proper three phase voltage in wiring. Oh, this is a, I'm going to defer this question uh, to Eugene, maybe for follow up after, after the presentation. Um, okay. I'll put you in touch with, uh, with Nick Stone there, who, can, who you can give some uh, specific information on, on right. some live right. products. Okay. Um, let's see, we are at 2 p.m. Um, so if any of our panelists need to jump off promptly, um, I'd just like to thank you all very much for joining us. This has been really interesting to, to dig into vacuum. Obviously, we're just still scraping the surface of what we could talk about. This could be, you know, a multi-day series. Um, and hopefully, we'll have some of you on in the future as Plants to Plants continues. Um, if you do have time uh, to stick around and answer a couple more questions from the field, I welcome you to do so. I at least will stay on for, for a few additional minutes. Um, but uh, otherwise, this is Plants to Plants by Sci-Fi Systems. Uh, we have uh, Richard Matthew from uh, Casey Gen, uh, Gene Ligman from Leibold Vacuum, and Jason Steele uh, from Bush Vacuum here with us discussing uh, vacuum technology. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Any last questions from the field out there? I'll, I'm going to double check the Q&A panel. Nothing. Um, if, if nobody else has uh, a last question, um, I have, you know, I have one, um, which is in thinking about, you know, we've been talking about a lot about deep, deep vacuum. Um, yeah, we've been talking about deep, deep vacuum applications, but some vacuum applications are not so, so deep. You know, in solvent recovery in particular, we're not going down into the micron range, uh, you know, typically in our specific systems. Although we've seen some arguments uh, of other operators doing that, you know, uh, there's many ways to skin a cat. Um, I wonder, uh, Richard, if you might be able to address how do you weigh the, uh, the energy intensity of uh, vacuum, creating more vacuum versus using more heat? You know, let's say that Thermal, uh, you know, thermal degradation is less of an issue um, for a specific process. Uh, is vacuum typically, uh, should you use as little vacuum as possible to achieve what you're going for and rely on heat to do the rest of the work? Or is vacuum actually an efficient option uh, going uh, into deeper vacuum and using less heat? Yeah, vacuum is an efficient option by using better vacuum and using less heat. And many times, Vacuum pumps are used for that particular reason for uh, saving energy for one thing and maybe not discoloring the product. For instance, in the manufacture of penicillin, they use vacuum pumps to dehydrate or dry it uh, rather than heat it because of the cost of heating it. And secondly, uh, you could uh, discolor the product. So vacuum, uh, from my experience has proven to be a more efficient way than adding heat. Now, yeah. a little heat is no harm. Right, absolutely. So this is something we've been sort of experimenting with or thinking about is at what vacuum depth we should be evaporating ethanol. Now there are practical consequences of deeper vacuum around materials handling that we talk about. Uh, for example, bumping and the, uh, you know, and nucleate boiling in the process. We're trying to typically avoid 
creating a big foamy mass that's going to occupy a lot of volume in order to protect our pumps. But then again, maybe going into deep, deeper vacuum and having very precise metering of the, uh, of the solution into your system uh, to allow it to essentially bump uh, efficiently could be something to explore. And I want to throw it out there for all of our attendees that if you are interested in a novel application, pushing the boundaries of, of sustainable uh, and efficient applications, we're here to work with you on custom projects. If you want to go do deep mm -hmm. vacuum solvent recovery, uh, we are here to, uh, to, to do that with you. Um, this brings up uh, another point for that specific application that I'm hoping, Jason, you might be able to chime in on. And that is uh, for systems where you're, you actually are going to have a vapor load um, and you are going from a deep vacuum environment into a, uh, a less uh, deep vacuum environment, <laughs> but maybe you want to keep that uh, in a vapor phase where it's a condensable gas, but you're wanting to go from a very low uh, vacuum environment to a higher pressure environment. Are there, you know, pump solutions that can uh, offer both the ability to initially bring your uh, chamber down to vacuum in the first place, but are capable of passing a vapor load from that environment into another environment? Uh, it's going to depend on the vapor pressure of the material, really, because depending on when it's going to be, at what pressure point is it going to be a liquid and what pressure point is it going to be a, a vapor is, or a gas is the most important part. So w you can use different tricks to uh, regulate pressure, um, and that's one way. You can do a pressure control valve, which you can, if you want a deeper area, you can have it. Uh, regulated on one side, and then if you need to adjust that pressure later on, you can, but um, I think that's all I would have to say on that. Okay, is that, yeah, you actually, you're touching on pressure control. That's something that I, uh, I'm i really interested in is, you know, detail uh, um, pressure control systems. Are you, are actually, you talking about a, a bleed valve or? Uh, uh, well, I, I just thought sometimes people, what they do, um, if you want to have it in a vapor base and condense it later, is they will have a coming from a booster and then since the booster will then have a condenser on the back end of it because it will be at a higher pressure easier to condense on the one side before it goes to a vacuum pump so you can put an inner stage in between or an after cooler some people do that um, so that's another way i've seen done uh, and we, we've done it for some pharmaceutical applications where they want to get it gas phase as far as they can they need it deep but they don't want to buy a big expensive heat exchanger to condense out the vapors, they'll, they'll put it right after the booster. And so it's somewhat atmospheric there at a higher pressure right on the after side and then they can condense it out there. That uh, sounds like a really interesting application. It's kind of what I had in mind is that, you know, cause we're, we're sort of on the, on the brink there between a vacuum pump and a, and a compressor, right? At that point, yeah. where in this case, the, the, uh, the booster is providing a pressure differential, but it's almost pushing it. Uh, you yeah. know, you're pushing against a positive pressure, which is more the job of a compressor. But for example, in ethanol, you know, you got to condense, you have to condense it. So if you're in a really deep uh, vacuum environment, it's going to have to go, you're going to have to go down to a very low temperature to condense the ethanol in a deep vacuum environment. But maybe you can use a booster, boost the pressure on the outlet of the booster, and then condense there, which it sounds like the pharmaceutical industry has already sort of piloted uh, those applications. So Emmett, are you talking about a differential pump system? differentially pumped in multiple different chambers or just one, one different differential pumping? Uh, do you want to uh, expand on that? You're asking a question. I mean, mine, my uh, question is purely hypothetical. So the answer so, would be, well, yes, both. I mean, for example, in a distillation column, right? You have, you have like, you know, your chemical, uh, um, your petrochem type processes, right? It's, it's like your short path distillation, except you're instead of running at one vapor point, you're running at a whole bunch of different vapor points. And because you have a column that has several chambers, right? And you have essentially restrictions between the chambers. The essential thing that controls the pressure inside of each one of those chambers inside that distillation column is not the vacuum pump. It's actually the temperature that you operate. So you have to have condenser coils inside each one of those different chambers running at different temperatures. And that's because you're running with condensables, right? Remember, the best way to, to pump a condensable is to condense it. So, and then you can also use, as Jason mentioned, blowers or mechanical boosters as um, means, means by which to 
change the pressure to aid in, con in condensing. If, say, you're limited, um, you want to condense water vapor, but you don't want your, uh, you want to go fairly low pressure, but you don't want the um, condensing liquid to be less than freezing temperature, for example. So you need to raise the pressure of the water vapor high enough so that it will condense at still some temperature that's higher than freezing temperature because um, you can create other problems that way, right? So, right. Um, but yeah, a differential pumping is something that's done quite frequently in the scientific world. It's, there are pumps actually that have differential pumping in them. So there's turbo example, a multi inlet turbo that um, a number of companies uh, sell, you know, Leibold has these, they're, they're in every mass spec that exists in the world, right? So you have different inlets going to different points on the turbo pump that gives you a different amount of vacuum pumping to give you differential pressure. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, if you're going to control vacuum by bleeding gas into your chamber, um, it's best to do both restricting the, the suction of the, of the pump and bleeding gas, meaning you put a variable position um, valve on the vacuum line and you have a gas bleed that goes into the chamber, you will get rock steady solid pressure control that way. You can do pressure control by varying the speed of your pump. So if you're differentially pumping with a blower, you can actually use a, very, a variable frequency drive to change the pressure at which you maintain inside both the suction side and the discharge side of that blower by pumping speed. Um, or you can just use uh, valves, um, restrictions in pumping. But if you're pumping, if you're working with condensables, by far the best way to do it is to change your vapor points by changing the con the um, the the actual chiller coil temperatures that are inside those individual chambers. Um, and I wanted to just mention also um, for the um, the solvent recovery question that you were just talking about a minute ago, Emmett. There is a way actually to yes, under vacuum to make your system much more efficient by recovering the heat from your, con from your condenser and using it and pumping it back into your boiler, right? Because you don't have to add heat in the form of electric heat and then pump it out in the form of uh, refrigeration and then just waste it to the atmosphere, right? That's a completely inefficient way to do that. Um, I have some experience with this, so feel free to contact me offline. We can talk about that much more. There's, that's a, actually a very fascinating thing to think about. Um, heat recovery system in um, something like a solvent you're, recovery. Yeah, you're touching on uh, an area of development that we have had uh, multiple uh, allies in the field uh, working on waste heat recovery. And, and, you know, I think there's a many, many different ways to try and approach waste heat recovery, especially in solvent recovery field. Uh, very, very interesting topic. I think we're going to see some very interesting applications for that uh, coming to the field. There's some already out there. I think it's, it's a, an open book. We can go much, much deeper into waste heat recovery and using heat captured from a condenser, for example, uh, and putting that into the evaporator side or preheating or a completely separate process that requires a uh, process heating. Um, I see a question from the field, and I know that this answer is going to be um, it depends, right? But maybe we can at least bring it up and, uh, and close here because I, I like Photon Noir, uh, a longtime um, uh, Instagram influencer, as well as a poster on various uh, different uh, forums, uh, contributor to, to several different companies, very experienced chemical engineer in the cannabis and hemp space. Uh, so uh, props to him for, for chiming in. Uh, but he's asking, where is the balance of energy efficiency in the vacuum strength for evaporation uh, and condenser cooling. Uh, that is to say, you know, we talked about maybe uh, adding more vacuum to a process could be more efficient than heating, but if you have to cool for condensing on the other side, is there perhaps a condenser temperature range that we consider, well, if you have to go below this, then adding more vacuum probably isn't, uh, isn't worth it, right? Um, I know this is gonna be totally relative to the application, so, <laughs> Uh, but we are typically, let's just maybe talk about ethanol for a moment. Uh, say you're evaporating ethanol, you're recondensing ethanol, you could go deep, deep vacuum, uh, do that with very little heat. But then if you have to use a condenser, 
uh, to recondense. Is there sort of a temperature point at which we think, well, maybe you should just use less vacuum and bring, bring that temperature on the condenser up a bit? Any rules of thumbs out there? Um, yes. Um, this is thermodynamics, right? So thermodynamics is one of those... Um, it's one of those fields of study that everyone shudders about, but it's actually, you know, it's kind of like the rules of how heat transfers in the universe. There is an optimum point, and usually what you need to do is try to avoid the extremes. So if you're heating to higher temperatures, um, uh, and that's more extreme than, say, evaporating at closer to room temperatures or even sub-room temperatures, um, then the closer you get to ambient conditions, the more you're gonna opti optimize because you'll be either losing less heat or absorbing less heat from the, from the ambient. Um, of course, the efficiency of your installation matters a lot too. Um, but there is a fallacy out there that you can actually save energy by pumping vapor with a compressor as opposed to pumping it with a condenser. And that is actually a fallacy. You'll find, if you really look at the numbers, right, if I have a 24, if I have a 20 horse um, vacuum pump, it's not effectively, talking about pumping heat in a mass transfer, it's not gonna pump as much heat as a 20 horse chiller because you have a coefficient of performance on your chiller, you don't have it on your vacuum pump. Well, we, we lost you a little bit in the middle there, but I think uh, just to distill what you were saying is that essentially, at least in your opinion, and probably according to the, uh, the energy balance, that using a chiller to condense a condensable vapor uh, typically uh, is going to be more efficient than using a compressor to increase the pressure uh, to al allow you to use a more moderate temperature because there is some intrinsic loss of energy uh, in using a compressor and a condenser versus just relying on the condenser and uh, temperature reduction to achieve the same, essentially, uh, vapor transfer uh, or mass transfer from the uh, evaporation to the condensation side that, of the process. That's right. That, sorry about my connection. That's, no that's problem. correct. And there's also a, a, a question of equipment size, which means expense, right? right. Big equipment costs a lot. Um, you I'd, can like to, I'd like to see if uh, Richard or Jason have anything to add to that while you're, uh, you know, uh, Richard, Jason, any thoughts on evaporator uh, or on condenser efficiency uh, and a temperature breaking point at which you probably want to stop adding vacuum if you have to recondense the vapor? Yeah, because I mean, I've, what Gene said is is correct. Uh, you want to try to stay as close to room temperature as possible because then you don't have to heat or cool. Um, so if you, the deeper you get, like we're using this ethanol as an example, if you're going very, really, really, really deep, it, there's no point. It already boils at room temperature around 50 torr. So if we go down lower, now you have to preserve it from free. Well, it's not going to freeze because there's a little boiling uh, freezing point, but it's just another expense, another thing that you have to take a take an account for and if we're working with something that may freeze like water will start to freeze pretty easily at zero and that's just now you have to make sure you're not freezing your your liquids and your solvents so it's just it has a lot more complication now you have to heat your flask and heat your container too so you want to limit that as much as possible great richard any any last thoughts I uh, know uh, I just agree uh, that the closer you get to ambient, uh, the better, the less uh, energy used and uh, it varies with, uh, you know, product to product. Uh. Right, exactly. I think that my takeaway is what we see in the field, at least, is that um, heat is, um, if you are, if you have an efficient heat source, uh, producing heat is often uh, producing higher temperatures is more energy efficient than producing very low temperatures. Um, if you're producing, if you're going for a moderate temperature, then you and able to use something like a cooling tower, then a cooling tower that it relies on evaporative cooling is going to be more efficient than needing to produce heat by electricity, uh, or even if you're using natural gas. Um, but each one of these sources of hot or cold is going to need to be weighed on its specific efficiency of the system at the scale that you're applying it. Um, so it's hard to come up with a rule of thumb because there are breaking points in scale for all of these systems. Uh, but then generally speaking, if you go to a point where 
uh, both of both your uh, heat source and your condensation source are on the same uh, side of uh, ambient temperature. So both your, your you know both your heating heating and your uh, your cooling for condensing are both below ambient temperature or they're both above ambient temperature. Then you've probably uh, gone too far, right? Well, in either too much pressure or too little pressure, because by bringing the pressure uh, towards a more moderate level or or just using pressure to bring one of those temperatures below ambient or at ambient, uh, you're going to be able to use ambient temperature to your advantage and uh, have a more overall efficient system. So that's a sort of a rule of thumb that I think that we've uh, come to. But you know, so much of this is dependent on the application and other factors like flowability, as we're pointing to, that it's hard to make generalizations. Um, well, any uh, last words, just any sage advice for the audience before we sign off here? I think it's a good moment to uh, move uh, one on. One thing I would like to add is just make sure um, you people take care of your vacuum pumps. Uh, it's a key component in your operation that is often ignored. Uh, so it's, it's important for your operation. If you don't have a vacuum pump, you don't, you're not processing. So make sure you're doing your services, make sure you're doing everything the manual is recommending as far to have as long as pro, uh, life of that equipment as possible, uh, because it's, <laughs> I, I see pumps fail too frequently, too early in their life. And it, it's a sad sight. Absolutely. You know, routine maintenance, preventative maintenance, Make sure you're replacing your seals on time, checking your lubricants, uh, replacing your lubricants, any other parts that need have a replacement cycle, make sure you're scheduling them ahead of time so that you have an alert to tell you when you need to replace those. Have a maintenance schedule on the wall uh, nearby your vacuum pump so that you can sign off or have some other mechanism to remind you when maintenance needs to be done and do it proactively because yeah. <laughs> a failed pump can take you, you down. Yeah, cost and time, which is a bigger yes. cost even than yes. uh, just cost of a new pump, so. Yes. Uh, Richard? I would uh, just uh, caution people when they're interested in getting a new vacuum system is to provide as much information as possible to the manufacturer. Of course, the operating pressure, the pump down time required, the volume of the system, gas load, uh, the inlet manifold, and what are your economic priorities? Is it process recovery? Is it first cost? Is it operating cost? Give them all the information that you can possibly give them so they can help you size it. And finally, uh, be precise on what you want. I did a calculation the other day about handling gaseous uh, mixtures, and we would you had a few pounds per hour of water and air. And based on pumping from atmosphere to four tour, we needed uh, 600 CFM. Going to two tour, I needed uh, 1,120. So just think of the uh, additional cost if you get Cavalier and say, well, make it two tour, right? Um, you think it's only two millimeters difference. Well, it pretty much doubles the size of the system. Uh, so I would caution everybody to be extremely precise and accurate. That, that is great advice. And it's uh, one that we're always trying to, to take to heart ourselves and work on behalf of our clients. And to those of you out there that are buying your own pumps direct, yeah, get as, uh, as detailed data to your vendors as possible. Uh, try and get to the right size pump rather than going overkill. <laughs> sometimes it's hard to do that, but uh, and sometimes maybe additional vacuum will assist your process, but unless you're trying to do a research project or you want uh, for a very specific reason to go bigger than you need, um, try and hit it right on the head. Um, uh, Gene, last words uh, to take us off. Hey, so remember they're in the business of production, right? So production is what you're trying to do. Uh, this color every single one of your decisions. And here are some decisions that are really important with regards to vacuum. Um, if you buy a cheap vacuum pump, you say you can get a rotary vein pump for half of the cost, of, but 
if you spend an hour a week or an hour a month fixing that or ch that vacuum pump or changing the, that oil, you have to multiply that number of hours of lost production times the value of an hour of your production to find out what that cheap vacuum pump is costing you. You will probably find out that it's actually costing you more like hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars rather than a few thousand dollars extra for a vacuum pump. I think my connection is weak. Are you guys, can you guys hear me? I think yeah, we got that. Yeah. yeah, I think we got that. The takeaway okay. there was, uh, you know, a better pump uh, that has less downtime is going to save you money almost in all cases. And prioritizing operating expenditures is usually more beneficial than prioritizing capital expenditures or lower upfront cost if you're going to spend hours and hours needing to maintain or fix your pumps uh, when you're right. in production. And I would add one more thing. Have a spare of every single critical component in your most valuable production line. If you have a, a short path distilling unit and it's got critical components like your white film evaporator or your chillers or whatever that are critical failure mechanisms or your vacuum pumps, have a spare on the shelf. You might spend $100,000 on spares and if you save yourself one week of downtime, because it takes weeks and weeks and weeks to get some of these spares. You've already paid for your spares just in one week of downtime. So have spares of every single critical component. Make sure you rotate them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So have spares on the shelf. And as Jason just said, uh, use them. Don't just leave them on the shelf for years on years and expect them to be there and ready for you when you need yes. us. Great. Well, thank you all again for joining us on Plants to Plants. I look forward to uh, continuing our discussion on vacuum in the future. Um, so uh, thanks again, Richard Matthew from Casey Gen, Gene Ligman thank from you. Labeled Vacuum, and Jason Steele from Bush Vacuum, uh, all highly reputable vendors. We recommend all of them uh, for a variety of applications. Uh, we are Sci-Fi Systems here to provide you with end-to-end -end processing solutions for uh, hemp processing plants. Uh, and uh, work hand in hand with our clients to provide a best fit solution for your specific needs. Uh, join us again uh, next week and check our schedule at scifisystems.com uh, for the upcoming Plants to Plants next Thursday uh, and look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you all. Thank you. It's Rod Kite next week. Oh, that's right. Uh, so we have a legal and regulatory review next week with Rod Kite of Kite Law and Kite on Cannabis. One of the top lawyers in the space uh, will be coming to you all to discuss uh, regulatory and legal issues. This is one not to miss next Thursday, 1 p.m. Pacific. Thanks for joining us again. Goodbye.